Welcome to week nine mini lecture in 7512 NSC, Aviation Leadership and Communication. The previous weeks, we've been talking about the different leadership styles. We've been talking about some of the tools of leadership, such as motivation, politicking, and so on. We've also spoken about crisis leadership, leading in a crisis. But this week, we're talking about strategic leadership, that is, how to be able to keep an organisation on the right path or change its path if it's been performing badly. And as part of strategic leadership, strategic leadership always involves change. How do we go about bringing about change? So this is going to be an important one because one day you may have to lead at the strategic level, but even if you don't lead at the strategic level, you will be a follower in helping bring about change and part of change management. And as a follower, it's important to know what goes on so that you can be there to support the leader in bringing about their changes. So what are we going to be doing? We're going to be talking about strategic leadership and the process itself. We're going to be talking about analysing the internal and external environments that organisations operate within. We're going to be talking about strategy formulation, just touching on it, but in the lecture we'll go into it much deeper. Because strategy, understanding strategy is important because very often, if we want to achieve an outcome, there are a number of different ways we can do it. Which is the best way? And strategy is how we go about achieving an outcome. We'll talk about the change management process using a three-stage model, and we'll also find out that whenever change comes about, and you may have been part of this yourself, people will often resist change. It's just a natural thing. And we'll find out why and how leaders can get around it. And basically, we will be talking about skills from both the leader point of view, but also the follower point of view. What's strategic leadership itself? Well, first of all, it's about organisational performance in the long term. That is, where, where's the organisation going to be in 12 months' time, two years' time, 10 years' time? And that can be hard. And of course, the thing is, with strategic leadership, when we're talking about what is going to happen into the future, we've got to be able to predict the future. And that's not easy, is it? If we could predict the future positively, we'd all be fairly rich in this world. So the strategic leadership is about the ability to be able to anticipate what might happen, gain a vision in our mind about what we think should happen, and then being able to stay flexible throughout the process as different inputs come in to keep the organisation going along a particular direction. It's about the process of that direction and also inspiring people. I mean, change, let's face facts, people don't like change in most cases. Once people are set into a routine, they like to stay in that routine. But organisations have got to keep responding to changes in our environment. And so the thing is, what we want to be able to do is to make sure that people understand why that change is necessary. And the one thing is, that no person at the top can bring about change and manage it by themselves. They need all their other managers alongside with them, all working in unison. So that's no easy task. And we're going to be talking about how this is done. And this is particularly important. For example, in Qantas in Australia, Alan Joyce has had a very, very hard job with his strategic leadership and bringing about change. And he's got his critics, he's got his supporters. But very often we find that people don't often present the true facts. And we'll be studying different airlines, such as Alan Joyce's Qantas, to see, well, strategic leadership isn't as easy as some of the analysts think sometimes. And they'll sit back and they'll criticise Joyce, whereas they haven't taken all the situation into their consideration. The next thing, of course, is what are the skills we need to be able to be a good strategic leader? Now, these are the ones. Being able to anticipate and predict the future. And to do that, you've got to have a very high weight 
rate of, of awareness of what's going on around you. You've got to have that information power. You've got to be able to have those good problem solving skills we spoke about in lecture two. Being able to identify and sustain competitive advantage. That is, your organisation is out there to do something, but others are competing for the same market. And you might say, but I'm in government. We don't have to worry about that. Well, you do, because in government, every department competes for a slice of the budget that government has to spend each year. So it doesn't matter what's part of your organisation. You've got competition somewhere along the line. You've got to be able to take a look and say, with my strategy formulation and implementation, how well is it going? And be able to make those adjustments. Also, when you're involved in strategic leadership and change, you've got to be able to have good people to help take the whole organisation along. So you've got to be able to pick the right people, train them up, mentor them, and be able to encourage them and inspire them. You've got to be able to have clear goals and you've got to be a great communicator. Every leader has to be a great communicator, but particularly so in strategic leadership and change. So what's a strategic management framework? Let's take a look at it. First of all, we've got the internal environment. This is within the company itself. These are things that the company has a strong control over. We have the external environment and a good acronym to remember that is PESTLE, P-E-S-T-L-E, the political side. What sort of things are government doing? The economic side, how is the economy going? The actual sociological side, what changes are happening in society? The technological side, the legal side outside, and also what's happening to the ecology? How important is the ecology? and that the ecological side we operate. And this is particularly so for air airlines. Airlines are great polluters. And so what airlines have to be able to do is to show that they are good environmental citizens. So companies use this and they do what they call a SWOT analysis. Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. How do we use this? Well, we'll learn that in the course, that strengths and weaknesses look at the internal environment. Opportunities and threats, the external environment, and we'll be able to show you how you go about being able to do this. We'll talk about the vision, the mission. The mission is what we do today. The vision is where we want to be in the future. How do we formulate these so they're clear? And of course, the thing is, the gap between the vision and the mission is what we have to close. That's the change that we have to bring about. Once we know that gap, we can put that into strategic goals. And for every strategic goal that we have, what we have to do is, what is the best way of achieving that goal? And there will be a number of options, but the best one is the strategy that we pick. So we formulate the different strategies, and we turn these strategies into action plans, and we implement those action plans, and we evaluate how we're going with those action plans. There, there may be things that haven't gone as well as we have to, so we have to make little changes along the way. And what we then do is, from evaluating that strategy, we can then look back and say, is the vision still the same? Is the mission still the same? Has the gap changed? Have the strategic goals changed because the gap's changed? Are there new strategies? Is one strategy not working? We need a new strategy. Do, do we need to have better action plans? And so we keep going through that process. And this is a simple model. This is a great little model and it's one that I use in other courses as well. But simply being able to use this model and understand it means that if you have to lead change at a high level, you've got a very good model to work with. But if you're a follower, it helps you understand why things are being done the way they are in an organisation. We can have ways in which we can take a look at visions. For example, we look at them uh, in a way where we say, Visions can be weak or strong, and the results can be low or strong. And we say if we've got a weak vision and poor results, stagnation, the company's not going anywhere. If we've got a weak vision and we've got good results, we've got unsustainable success. That is, don't know how we achieved it, but it probably won't last. A strong vision but low results means we're going to have to change. The vision's not working. But where we have a strong vision and great results, we've got sustainable success. So simply being able to do 
and evaluation of our vision and the results is the important part of what we do. So, change. People don't like change, we said. So there's got to be a good need for change. And so what we know is that organisations operate within an environment and things are changing all the time. The internal environment changes within the company. For example, we might lose certain key people. The external environment changes. For example, there might be a new technology come along, such as the Boeing 787 Dreamliner, that really makes a game changer for airlines. So we have to be... <coughs> We have to know as to how to deal with this. And the thing is that every organisation is facing this change and it's occurring faster and faster. Societies change, technology changes, governments change laws. This is occurring all the time. We've got to be able to react to this and CEOs have got to be able to be aware of everything that they have control over and what they don't have control over and where they don't have control, how can they still make sure that they can guard against threats? So the big thing is, wherever change is required, it affects the followers in the organisation. They've got to know why and they've got to see the need for change. And very often we find within organisations, for example, we hear about a certain organisation laying off people. They might... It might be an organisation of 10,000 people and they have to lay off 1,000 people and everyone says, isn't that terrible? But the trouble is, perhaps if the organisation doesn't lay off 1,000 people, the whole 10,000 might lose their jobs. Sorry, lose their jobs. So this is one of the things that we have to understand and that's one of the things we'll be covering in the lectures. We'll talk about the leader's role in managing change. And of course, we've seen that in the model before and the one thing that we make sure of is that leaders often have to do things where they say, how's the organisation keeping up with what's going on outside? That is, for example, are there policies and procedures that are now out of date, they're no longer relevant, that we've got to change? Is my behaviour as a leader really the right sort of behaviour? Do I need to change myself? And they've got to be able to go around and listen to companies. That is, get out of their office, go around and listen to the people within the company so that they know what's going on in that environment within the company. If we look at change itself, again, as in strategic leadership, we had a model, we have a change also for bringing, sorry, we have a model for bringing about change. And what we say to ourselves is we have stage one, which is unfreezing. Stage two is the actual change itself. And stage three is the refreezing. Now, I use a little analogy. I say, think of it as you have a wagon and it's sitting on level ground and you want to move it to the top of the hill. And that moving it to the top of the hill is change itself. And so what we have to do is we have to take the wagon from its stationary position and start moving it. But once we get it to the top, we don't want it to roll back down the hill once we take all the force away that was needed to get it up there. And change is exactly the same. So what we have to do, first of all, is in the unfreezing, establish a sense of urgency amongst people. That is, things have changed and the organisation's going to have to change. If we don't change, our competitors are going to take our market share or someone else is going to take our share of the budget. So how do we bring about that change? First of all, we've got to get a powerful guiding coalition. For example, the CEO has got to get the top management team on side and the top management team have got to get all the other teams below them on side. So getting everyone on side and singing to the same sheet of music is important. Developing a compelling mission. This is the new vision for the future that's going to help make sure the company or the organisation fits in with the environment and the changes that have occurred. And of course, once we've got a compelling vision, we've got to be able to communicate that so that everyone can see this is the new direction of the company. For example, Microsoft has changed its vision a number of times over the past 10 years. Organisations have to do the same. Qantas has changed its vision. Emirates has changed its vision. So these are the things. We've got to be able to empower the employees to act on the vision. That is, very often when we bring about change, it's about trying to get rid of 
layers of unnecessary management. And it means we have to empower people. We've got to have some short-term wins. There's an old saying, nothing succeeds like success. So we've got to make sure that change has small bites as part of its uh, action plan to ensure that people's confidence is built up. They can see that it's achievable. And then the big thing is, once we've consolidated gains, we can say to people, look at what we've achieved so far. Think of what we can achieve for the future. Then once we've done that, we refreeze. That is, we're, we're pushing the wagon up the hill. And when we make the first set of goals, we have a chop put in place to stop the wagon from rolling back down. Then we can bring about the next part of the change, put the chalk under the wheel to stop it rolling back down the hill until we get to the top of the hill and we anchor it in place. That is, we refreeze. We stop it sliding back, the organisation sliding back to where it was or somewhere around that area. And that's one of the hard things. And then make sure that change is now part of the new organisational culture. We spoke about the fact that people don't like change. For example, it becomes a threat to their self-interest. A person who might be in charge of a large section now suddenly finds themselves in charge of a smaller section or, in fact, working for someone else. There's uncertainty. It's a natural part. People don't like certainty. We found that out in Maslow's model of motivation. People feel, I don't think this is going to really solve the company's problems or they can't see that the change is really necessary. They might say, but we're just going around a circle. We're not actually going ahead. There's a distrust of the leadership itself. That is, a, perhaps the company's just there to, to shave costs so that management can give themselves more bonuses. This is a threat to personal values. And there's a fear of being manipulated. These are all reasons that people resist change. And if we look at this little diagram here, it's a little bit like what people go through when they encounter grief. That is the loss of a loved one or being told that you've got a life-threatening disease. There's a denial that it's actually occurred. There's anger. Why me? There's confusion. I don't know what's going on anymore. Everything I've been used to is being turned upside down. Depression follows. And finally, we get to a crisis where our spirit's at, at its lowest ebb. But as people start to see, hey, things are changing and they're changing for the better, and we get starting to get a few successes, they start to build acceptance until finally there's a new confidence. And so there's a lot of similarity between what happens. And if we look at history, change is not new. This is written by Niccolò Machiavelli, who wrote The Prince back in 1469 to 1527. And he wrote right back then, it must be remembered there's nothing more difficult to plan, more doubtful of success, more dangerous to manage than a new system. For the initiator has the enmity or the opposition of all who would profit by the preservation of the old institution and merely lukewarm defenders and those who gain by the new ones. I like some of the sayings of Machiavelli and he's really summed it up. Hundreds of years ago and yet the same feelings occur in people today with change. So let's just remember, change has been part of human development. The big thing about getting that resistance to change around is First of all, getting people to show support of the change process. Being able to get out there and communicate. Communicate, communicate, communicate. Tell people why we need to change, what progress has been made, how they, they are important to that change. Don't micromanage, just let people get on and do the job. Tell them what has to be done and let them figure out the how themselves at their level. And make sure that there is adequate resourcing of the change itself and make sure that you, like crisis communication, you look ahead and you say some people are not going to handle it as well as others. Make sure that there's a support mechanism in place to help people. So this mini lecture has been another important one. Strategic leadership, talking about the long term and change management. Change management can be simply something that comes about as part of just a small change in the company or it can be uh, uh, the way in which you implement your strategic change itself. We've spoken about the importance of the internal and external environment and having a model that you work through, showing the urgency for the change, getting people on side, making sure you've got your vision and your mission. 
And then with the change management process, looking at the unfreezing, the change itself, and then the refreezing. Don't allow the organisation to go back to where it was. And I've seen that happen. And we'll show you in the course as to how to stop it from happening. How people resist change, it is a natural inclination. They are not being uh, blockers to the change process. It is a natural reaction. You as a leader can get people on side behind the change. If you're a follower, if you understand what happens during change, you may be able to help your peers accomplish a change. Thanks very much for your attention.